Shin Chi's Canoe by Nicola I. Campbell. Pictures by Kim Lafave. Imagine North America without buildings, cars, and electricity. You can only eat what you gather, hunt, or catch. You get fresh water from the creek. Your home was built using trees and animal hides, or it is underground. Your people live by their own rules and take care of their families and communities. As a child, you are surrounded by the love of your family and community. When Europeans came to the Americas, they believed that native people were uncivilized. They pushed them off their traditional lands and onto reserves or reservations. In the late 1800s, governments decided to colonize native people, forcing them to adapt to the European way of life. In both Canada and the US, as well as in New Zealand and Australia, laws were passed forcing native children to be educated in church-run boarding schools. The purpose of these schools was to sever all ties the children had to their families, cultures, and traditional territories. While attending these schools, the children learned European culture, religion, and language. They were given European names. They learned how to grow a garden, run a farm, and do carpentry. The children weren't allowed to talk to their parents or their siblings. They weren't allowed to speak their traditional language or practice their traditional way of life. Sometimes the children weren't allowed to return home for many years. Sometimes they never returned. Although some children had good experiences, many did not. There were approximately 130 residential Indian schools in Canada, and about 80,000 people living today have attended these schools. Although most closed in the 1970s, the last government-operated residential school in Canada did not close until 1996. More than 100,000 Native American children were forced to attend similar schools in the United States. In Canada, that number was 150,000. In order to make up for the devastating experiences of being sent to these schools, governments around the world have tried to make amends in various ways, either through financial compensation, such as the common experience payment offered to living survivors by the Canadian government, or through formal apology, as Stephen Harper did in 2008. However, nothing can make up for the tremendous loss of language, culture, and family Steadfast resistance, determination, courage, healing, strength of spirit, and an overwhelming love for our children and culture are the tremendous forces that have empowered Indigenous peoples around the world to overcome the profound impact that this part of history has had on them. Nicola I. Campbell The morning sun was shining so bright, Shishi Etko had to squint. She was on her way back to Indian residential school, and this year she wasn't alone. Shinchi, her younger brother, was coming too. Yaya, mom, dad, baby Sholtetko, Shinchi, and Shishi Etko were sitting together on the porch, waiting for the cattle truck that would come by and pick them up. Dad, it'll be summertime when we come home. Can you please build us a dugout canoe of our own? Shinchi said. My children, don't you like paddling with me anymore? Said their dad as he pulled them close. We love paddling with you, Shishi Etko said. But we're getting way too old and I want to learn to paddle all alone, said Shinchi, who was six years old. Last year, on her first day at Indian residential school, Shishietko had been punished because she could not understand the English words. Then they cut her long braids and threw them away and washed her head with kerosene. And so that morning before the sun rose, 
Shishietko asked, Yaya, can you cut our hair today? Afterwards, Shinchi, Shishietko, and Yaya went up to the mountain to put their braids away. Tells you something about how important their braids are to them. When the cattle truck arrived, their dad tucked a tiny canoe into, Sh into Shinchi's hand. My children, their mom said with tears in her eyes, if we could, we would keep you here at home. We would never ever let you go, but it's the laws that force us to send you away to residential school. Yaya squeezed them so tight they could hardly breathe. We'll be waiting for you to come home, she said. Then Shinchi and Shishi Echo climbed into the back of the cattle truck with all the children from their Indian reservation. Dust came in waves, getting in their eyes and in their noses until they could hardly breathe. It followed the truck like a snake all along the valley. My Shinchi, we will not see our family until the sockeye salmon return. These are the things that you must always remember, Shishietko said, gesturing to the trees, the mountains, and the river below. At night, when you go to sleep, remember the tug of the fish when you and Dad pulled the nets in and we made smoke and wind-dried salmon. Shinchi could not help himself. He looked at everything. The mountain with the trail that led to the caves, the deer in the field by their house. He memorized every fishing spot, the place where he caught the great big frog, the grasshoppers, the crickets, and the slugs, until the rattle bump of the cattle track truck rocked him to sleep. Shinchi was dreaming when he heard Shishi Etko say, it's time to wake up now, my Shinchi. When he opened his eyes, it was dusk, and all he could see was the dark silhouette of the church steeple. Remember, my English name is Mary. Your English name is David. And don't forget, we aren't allowed to talk to each other until next June. Shishi Etko gave him the tiny canoe that their father had made. This, my Shinchi, is for you. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, be careful to keep it hidden. When they got off the truck, the priests and sisters said, juniors and intermediates stand single file in separate lines. Boys stand here, girls stand over there. Then single file, they marched inside. That night in the junior girl's wing, Shishietko wondered if her Shinchi was okay. He was used to sleeping near his sisters. He had never slept alone. Down the hall in the junior boy's wing, Shinchi lay in bed wide awake. He held his tiny canoe safely in his hands. The sweet scent of cedar smelled just like his dad. Dad said the spring salmon come up the river first then the sockeye come in the summertime, and that's when we can go home again. Finally, he drifted off to sleep. They went to mass once each day. That's where they learned how to pray. For half of a day they worked, the other half they went to school. The girls did the cooking, cleaning, knit mittens and scarves, and they laundered and sewed everyone's clothes. The boys learned how to farm, do carpentry and blacksmithing. And three times a day, all the children went outside to play in the wind, the rain, the hail, or snow. In the dinner hall, the boys and girls sat on opposite sides of the room. Brothers and sisters were not allowed to talk to one another. They made up sign language to say hi or I miss you. For breakfast, the children ate porridge and burnt toast. Through the doors, they could see their children, their teachers carrying steaming plates of bacon, eggs, and potatoes from the farm. For lunch, they ate thin soup, and dinner was hard buns with stew. For dinner, the teachers had meat, vegetables, and corn. The children were never given enough food. When autumn was over and winter arrived, the days were short and the weather was cold. Shinchi was lonely 
and he was hungry. He missed his mom, his dad, and Yaya. He missed Shishietko and baby Shultetko too. He snuck out the back door and ran to the river nearby his school. He stood there with his tiny dugout canoe. Shinchi could not help himself. He looked at everything. He listened to each crystal snowflake that danced down from the sky and fell on his face. He breathed the cool breath of winter until the land was covered in a blanket of fresh snow. Finally, when eagle song echoed through the valley, traveling just beyond reach, he sang his grandfather's prayer song and his voice echoed from mountain peak to mountain peak. Shin Chi placed his tiny canoe in the river, knowing that the current would carry it safely home. Then Shin Chi made a friend. His name, English name was John. Little mischief times two, they learned how to steal food. In the orchard, they found apples and the root cellar carrots and potatoes. To their delight, one day they discovered preserved cherries only to realize they had black olives instead. Early one morning when spring had finally set in, Shishi Etko snuck down to the river. To her surprise, she heard her grandfather's song. Her Shinchi was already there with his fishing line. I'm checking to see if the sockeye salmon are here, he said in deep concentration. Not yet, my Shinchi, but they will come. When the, sockeye fa sa sa sorry. when the sockeye finally swam up the river, the dust rose around the cattle truck like a great big butterfly that followed them all the way home. Shinchi could hardly wait. Shishi Edko, he asked over and over again. How much longer until we get home? Little mischief you. We'll get there soon, Shishi Etko said, with sparkles in her eyes. When the cattle truck arrived at last, their mother and Yaya ran to greet them. Oh, my grandchildren, we missed you, Yaya said, squeezing them tight. Your dad is in the woodshed, said their mom, as she hugged them too. And this time, she had tears of happiness in her eyes. Shishi Etko and Shinchi ran as fast as they could all the way to the woodshed. There they found their dad, carving them their very own dugout canoe.